Mark Morigi's uh, research interests include Syriac incantation bowls, the Syriac language more generally, Aramaic epigraphy in late antique Mesopotamia, and Aramaic dialect dialectology. As it relates to the theme of our session, it is also worth noting that Marco is the editor of the most important collection of Syriac incantation bowls and has recently published an edited volume with C.M. Biro on <coughs> Syriac magic, which is titled Studies in the Syriac Magical Traditions. This evening, Marco will present a paper titled Comparison and Its Limits, a Perspective for a New Approach to Aramaic Magic Texts of Late Antiquity in a Comparative Perspective. So, Marco, go ahead and begin, please. Thank you for your uh, presentation, uh, Joe, and uh, thank you for all the colleagues and friends present tonight or this morning, uh, according to the respective views. And um, <clears throat> just a, a little, uh, a little uh, um, forward to this uh, um, to this presentation. Some of the things you will see, you have already seen them. In other presentations, I uh, add in uh, other occasions, because uh, the uh, subject that Joseph uh, uh, asked us to develop for this uh, um, for this seminar uh, um, actually was not one of the main uh, interests uh, in my research. I'm basically interested in texts and uh, in uh, comparative grammar. And uh, incantation texts uh, were for me the base for uh, uh, grammatical studies, especially for uh, the Mesopotamian variety of Syriac that I strongly believe existed and was uh, uh, in some cases different from the so-called Syriac or classical Syriac we have in other sources. Nevertheless, I, of course, uh, uh, handled these texts and uh, these texts are to be, of course, uh, treated uh, as uh, uh, according to their specific characteristics. And uh, these characteristics imply uh, the usage of uh, methodological categories. And uh, when you go into these topics uh, that are not exactly what I studied also during my career, it's, of course, one of the first uh, uh, situations you get in is the uh, comparison and the comparatism. And so I would like just to share with you what I did uh, meet while uh, comparing texts and uh, being, uh, of course, uh, uh, and again, uh, stressing the fact that my main topic was uh, studying languages. And so uh, comparat com comparison is basically uh, of the analytical type, I would say, uh, rephrasing uh, um, Bonnell and also rephrasing the, the Joseph Sanso, of course. And so uh, it is a comparison limited to corpora, to very uh, narrow periods, and also, um, in this case, geographical uh, areas. So I will share my uh, presentation, but it is a presentation I uh, strongly, uh, I think that you, in some ways, you will recognize some of you for one or the other seminar we were um, we were part, we were uh, <clears throat> taking part in. I started to begin with a, a couple of statements that are, in my opinion, uh, quite uh, telltelling about what will we see at the end of the presentation. What are the uh, conclusions I got, uh, of course, uh, just for my experience, then I will, will be happy to share the, uh, vision, the, the positions of uh, colleagues and to know them, of course. The first is a very famous quotation from, uh, 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 from a medieval uh, um, philosophical uh, treaty, that is a, a treaty by Bernard of Cluny, and um, I'm not quite documented about him, but as far as I know, it was a representative of the so-called nominalistic uh, philosophical uh, uh, school that they used to say that uh, we just know the names of things and no more, nothing more. And we don't know the idea behind if it is real or not. We cannot single out any real characteristic of one thing but the name. And so they say of the 
the, the Pristina uh, Rosa, which was the original rose, we don't have nothing. Uh, we just know the name. And so we know just the, the simple names of what we are faced in uh, texts, uh, especially when they tell us things that are uh, related to the past. On the other side, I tried to switch in a more poetic, if not a dramatic situation. So I, try, I chose uh, an, uh, a worldwide well-known tragedy, uh, William Shakespeare, Romeo, uh, Romeo and Juliet. And this is a, a quite famous also quotation. So Juliet asks what's in a name and uh, uh, she uh, gives uh, herself an answer that which we call a rose. By any other name, would smell as sweet. It would seem that rose is just a name, but we all know this, uh, this sweet smell. And uh, uh, the name of uh, the just the name, it's uh, Rose. So Rose is just a name. On the other side, uh, Shakespeare demonstrates to, um, to uh, know the, uh, sorry, the, the presentation has been is stopped. Okay, just a minute. Okay. No, it seems to be aware of this uh, tendency of the so-called nominalistic um, uh, school. What you see here is uh, the object of my study. It's now 20 years. And uh, incantation, Syriac incantation bowls uh, with the corpus uh, actually uh, reaching the number of 165, but it's uh, surely of some more uh, pieces. Uh, I had no time to go to to go through the uh, auction catalogs, and usually in auction catalogs you can find some more uh, items. Uh, uh, in uh, in this case, uh, I stopped my <laughs> survey of uh, catalogs uh, uh, before uh, the year two thousand. So I have still a lot of catalogs to see, but it's not easy to have them and also to to get the right ones in the sense that you may find an incantation ball even in a catalog uh, where there is just fine art as a title. And so fine art, you can find everything as you can easily understand. What I uh, tried to do is that uh, as, uh, as, I, uh, as I did during my, uh, the past years, uh, I tried to do a little exercise of comparativism when I tried to uh, single out uh, a, um, a Jewish theme, the so-called divorce text in uh, Syriac incantation balls. And of course, in this case, I had to, and that's why my first step in the, in the, uh, in the uh, history of the research, uh, in the, of my personal path into comparativism in the sense we want to discuss tonight, I had to uh, step from the simply analytic dimension, which was an uh, intra uh, uh, Syriac incantation ball perspective to an, uh, would say uh, the other uh, uh, use of comparativism, which is the illustrative one. It means that I had to find more general categories that were to uh, comprehend both the cases of Syriac balls and the cases of other balls. For example, I, uh, and I referred to a very famous study of uh, Sebastian Brock about the Jewish traditions in Syriac sources. Of course, adding to the traditions uh, singled out by Brock, the incantation bowls and amulets I was uh, studying. And uh, uh, of course there were themes that I could single out and that I went on searching for them in the text. And uh, I saw, uh, got uh, conclusions regarding both the Jewish text, which you see in the first quotation, the first uh, uh, red square in the, in the slide, which means that I found uh, uh, while I was searching for Jewish uh, items in Syriac bowls, I found uh, Christian uh, themes in uh, Jewish bowls, of course. So comparatism, uh, when uh, it's extended in a certain area, of course, gives results. Uh, I experimented this, not only one, but the two ways. So you can get also the reflex of what you are searching in one source in the, in the other. 
And uh, I got some uh, the conclusion you see in the second square as are already published since some years. So I got a series of data, but the most striking for me was this, of course, was uh, uh, the uh, C and D uh, that are uh, more concerned with grammar and with lexicon. But nevertheless, they uh, uh, led me also to, uh, in some way, uh, um, think about and uh, reflect on the, uh, on the dynamics of what magic uh, was in the sense of uh, a category that could be used uh, when uh, uh, studying these texts uh, through the uh, linguistic comparison uh, that, it, that was in any case uh, uh, extending far uh, uh, out of the boundaries of grammar and the simple linguistic uh, analysis. And I started uh, isolating the uh, idea of uh, the magician as a mediator that will be uh, again uh, recalled at the end of the presentations. And I also tackled the famous uh, uh, vexata question about uh, comparatism, com comparison and comparativism, which is the fact that the modern uh, cultural uh, anthropological uh, uh, literature uh, gives us a plethora, I would say, a full amount of tools uh, which uh, could seem useful to uh, uh, work on uh, comparison in the uh, ancient uh, magical traditions. I don't think that is uh, absolutely automatic uh, in the sense that, of course, uh, even primitive societies uh, investigated by modern scholars are not the same as ancient societies that were not investigated by any modern scholar, of course, in a contemporary, on a contemporary base. Uh, and this, in any case, led me to try to uh, reflect on some kind of models the modern anthropologists provide uh, in, in the context of the study of magic, and not only in the context of studying of magic, but in general, in the context of study of societies and their cultural, uh, the, cult the cultural phenomena that are linked to the life of society. So while I was doing that, uh, it, came, uh, it came out that I could, at least tentatively, uh, use uh, some word to, um, uh, I would say, project uh, the uh, model of uh, my comparison, the comparison I was much at home with, which is, of course, a grammatical comparison. And so the, the exemplary word is translation, of course. That's the category I had in my mind, of course. Translation is a very complex process, but uh, it is a substantially a transfer that goes into an adaptation or adoption, which are two uh, different phenomena that I, I, for the moment, put in that same case, and then the absorption in another context. That's what I did basically thinking about uh, linguistic, uh, linguistic uh, phenomena. And of course, then I started, and uh, uh, this is, a, uh, um, at least uh, in my case, it seems to me a never ending effort to go through the literature and to find all the uh, definitions we have, uh, we could uh, see and read in uh, the texts uh, regarding the uh, phenomena that we study uh, through the, um, or thanks to the uh, methodological tool of comparatism. And so uh, they are, of course, hundreds, hundreds, and they have written these studies not in only one language. So it's very, it's very difficult to, to, be, uh, to be, to have a complete analysis. But in any case, these are uh, the one you see in the slide are some of the most frequent I found. And uh, in one word, uh, this led me to the uh, uh, conclusion that uh, uh, yes, comparatism is a, a very important, uh, uh, of course, methodological categories, 
but uh, it has been, uh, um, in, in my experience, it must be uh, declined in, uh, uh, according to certain careful um, um, criteria, criteria. And uh, uh, that these criteria are basically inspired by the caveats of this study by Stern, but also by other studies. This I quoted just because it is a very, uh, I saw that this book had a great editorial success, so I could uh, quote it in, in order to uh, let also uh, colleagues and friends to locate it in libraries. I see that it is, uh, uh, it's the archeology span and the material culture of the Babylonian Talmud, it's, it's quite, uh, it, 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 it went, <clears throat> It went very, uh, for me, it goes also beyond the scope of the volume. It's very important and very interesting. So, as I said, uh, I uh, basically uh, found myself in agreement with the idea that it is an idea of Bonnell that I found also in, uh, um, in, jo in Joseph Sanso studies. I'm not saying this, of course, because Joe is a friend and is our, <laughs> but it's it's real because I I tried to to find something more about comparison, and I found out that analytical comparison, which is the comparison uh, that it is uh, oriented around similar kinds of individuals or uh, uh, groups uh, in a particular period of time, and I would say in a particular kind of items in the case of in magical uh, texts is uh, very fruitful as a, a methodological tool. That's of course uh, becomes uh, more difficult when you go out of the easily uh, definable uh, context of texts in the sense that you can say, and you can uh, decide that your comparison is limited to, for example, the morphology of a certain amount of texts in a certain amount of uh, uh, documentation. And uh, as I told before, uh, during the, uh, the minutes preceding our meeting, uh, uh, many, many doctoral dissertations, I also uh, had the honor of uh, supervise one, some of them, uh, are based on, for example, corpora of manuscripts and their, cho and their these corpora are, are chosen basically, for example, because are of the same period or the same scribal school or the same uh, area or the same monastery in the case of Syria. For example, it, this, is, this was one of the more, uh, uh, much more used criteria, especially in the past decades and I would say centuries. And this is, of course, the conjugation, the, the um, uh, 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 working together of these two kinds of approaches uh, of the comparison that led me to share the idea that uh, as uh, Giuseppe Veltri wrote uh, more than 10 years ago, but not only Giuseppe Veltri, now I have, uh, it comes to my mind Giuseppe because we discussed this sometimes uh, in the past, that magic is uh, uh, particularly difficult uh, when it is the object of comparison, because magic has no uh, existence of its own, and magic is uh, a relationship, and uh, the relationship work like processes, and so you don't have, let's say, for example, uh, uh, a, a, a ceramic typology or likely things uh, that you can compare from the material point of view, and then you can limit yourself to a, so a series of well-defined characteristics. The process and the relationships, uh, uh, of course, uh, change uh, over time, place, but I would say over people. So each actor uh, in the magical process can, of course, uh, refer to the process uh, according to his or her a personal uh, inclination. So um, magic is something that uh, it's not safe or joke, but it says quite in this case, it is a, an hidden, it's the hidden part that is uh, the interest of magic. It's not much the 
uh, non-unhidden part, of course. So I would say that in front of this uh, comparison has given me the idea that in spite of the fact that syncretism is, a, it could be also a good uh, methodological or, or heuristic category, I would prefer to say when I find texts with many characteristics that come from different uh, traditions, let's say from different linguistic stocks or different varieties of the same language, I would uh, find easier to talk about plurality. And uh, plurality is something that uh, it's, uh, in my opinion, it's quite uh, more suitable, at least for me, for the results of my comparison. Why, if we have situations where uh, the elements are so much entangled, uh, which is impossible to discern one from the other. And it's, for example, the case I just have in mind that it is a certain spelling of a certain verbal form, that it is completely the same, exactly the same in two sources of two Aramaic varieties of the same period as could be in the incantation bowls from Mesopotamia. So I would say that that's a shared trait that can indicate fusion. And fusion in languages are quite uh, easy to detect all over the studies of languages. So I don't know if I correctly uh, uh, meant what Joseph wanted me to discuss because I really put myself into something like a uh, auto-analysis while during uh, the reading all the stuff I read for this uh, for this short presentation, which is ending in a few seconds, but it's what I thought uh, could be put on the, uh, for the discussion, for the <clears throat> final discussion uh, in front of colleagues and friends that are much more than me uh, used to compare uh, in much more difficult uh, environments and contexts. And thank you for your... Uh, Et cetera. So <clears throat> the second uh, presentation for this evening is by Ortel Paz Sa'ar and Samia Maya Castro. Ortel Paz Sa'ar is an assistant professor at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. She is a cultural historian focusing on Judaism and interreligious context, uh, contacts, particularly from late antiquity to the medieval period. Her research focuses on magic and rituals, funerary culture, and digital humanities. Her publications revolve around exchange and contacts between Jewish and non-Jewish magic, questions of identity in life and death, and the application of digital tools to illuminate new aspects of all of these features. As it relates to our program this evening, it is also worth emphasizing that she is the author of an important book on Jewish love magic. Ortel Paz will be presenting with uh, Samia Maya Castro. Maya received her BA in anthropology from Queens College of City University of New York. Her research interests include early Byzantine history, funerary culture, magic, and religion. She is currently working on a research master's at Utrecht University, where she is writing a thesis about early Christian funerary feasting. This evening, Ortel Paz and Maya will present a paper titled, Reading and Writing Magic, The Gendered Use of Magic Books. The floor is yours, thank you. Thank you very much, Joe, and good evening, everybody, or good morning, depending on your time. I believe that uh, given the topic, the specific parts of the topic of our papers, it is better if we start actually in reverse chronological order, and we start with Maya's paper that will discuss uh, late medieval and uh, early modern issues, and then we'll continue with mine that actually focuses more on uh, late antiquity and then moves on to this period. So, uh, Maya, I cannot see you, but I hope that the audience can. So, would you? I hope the audience can and hear me. Now I see you. Yes, we can see you and hear you. Start. I can share my screen. Fingers crossed that Zoom works.
Um, yeah. uh, can you all see the presentation? Yes, we can see it well. Thank you. Okay. Um, the presentation paper I will be describing is called uh, Magical Instruments or Textbook Magic. As Dr. Sar said earlier, I'm a little later on in the period and it just came to be about through the process of researching. A lot of uh, my topic has to deal with the use of occult items in text form when it comes to gender practice. And I believe that the text became more widely available for male witches or the accused male witches in the later medieval early modern period uh, because of the advent of the uh, printing machine for books. Fascination with the occult has stemmed from nearly all records of human history, from as early as that in Rome, where the term occult stems from, to the contemporary explorations of neo-paganism and the reclaiming of indigenous cultural beliefs. Meaning hidden or secret, occult has been applied to mean anything that is not the mainstream segments of cultural rhetoric. It is the category of the other, and we can see how the application of so-called tools of the occult have led to disastrous events. In this paper, I will be discussing several instances in which male European uh, male victims of the European witch trials were prosecuted based on the evidence regarding the use of occult tools. In particular, I will be focusing on the circumstances in which the accused had allegedly used text in their form of witchcraft. The collection of accusations, stems, um, and evidence will be gathered from sources for the trials held in Normandy and England. According to William Monter in his article, Codes and Eucharists, the Male Witches of Normandy, written texts have sometimes been tied to witchcraft accusations in Normandy and so did their punishments. Priests seem to have been the most reported accused who had written texts either on their person or were seen using books that were magical. For example, the priest Jacques Godavent was accused in 1605 that he had employed a booklet of recipes for curing spells. Ironically, the witnesses also testified that he had used these things hidden in a missile. Moreover, Godavent was found in the possession of characters inscribed on virgin parchment, on which were written the words of invocations of devils. The evidence against him was considered sound, and he was sentenced to death by hanging, followed by the burning of his body. Very similar accusations have been pronounced several years earlier, in 1598, against a pair of priests who were said to possess a book of diabolical invocations and incantations with figures, similar to what you see on the screen here. They too were kept inside of reverie. Magical items such as these were either scrutinized and destroyed after trial, or if the text was seemingly destroyed beforehand, would be laid against the accused in trial. Similarly, a pharmacist named Etienne Magnor was accused of being in possession of a bad book containing many recipes and magical signs. The paper was covered in odd symbols and four pieces of virgin paper, parchment, containing indications of evil spirits. And some of these he had used together with a male friend at a wedding ceremony, meaning to bind the groom. It meant it as a joke. However, his sentence was less harsh and only included a monetary fine and a five-year banishment from the territory of Rowan. Both clergy and secular males were among the accused merchants, for example, but their reported behaviors, but their behaviors were often reported by those around them. Social suspicion is what has led to these deaths in nearly all of the documented cases with magical texts, such as described in there. The scrutiny often dealing with healing, which is not out of bounds given suspicion of plague being spread by witchcraft and also healing by it. What is important to note is that in Normandy's trials, summarized by William Monter, some of these male defendants were accused of owning or using these written texts, inscribed parchments, booklets, and full-scale grimoire. These objects do not appear in any of the trials for female dependents from the same place and period. In the article titled Masculinity and Male Witches in Old and New England, 1593 to 1680, E.G. Kent refers to over 86 cases of male witches from Essex, England. From these cases, we can see that the men were almost just as likely to be suspected as witches outright, and not simply by other accused. In Normandy, social positions varied in terms of accusations. However, in Essex, there was a higher correlation in men accused of having higher social positions 
within their own community. Next in her book, Cases of Male Witches in Old and New England, E.J. Kent writes, just as the ideal godly man of early modern English communities was a scholar, so was the ideal evil man. Reading was a morally ambiguous activity. This is how and why Kent suggests that male witches were more bookish in contrast to female witches. The Essex male witch was closer to a scholar in training and in addition to their most studious nature, were it seen as less likely to have malicious intent. A learned man could be as witch as much as he could be a minister. This should not be confused with innocence since they would also be prosecuted for magic just in a different context. While female witches were seen as inherently accused of malicious intent, maleficium. Male witches were indicted for magic and from there would have more of a choice in terms of intent. As stated earlier, a male witch, still a witch, and thus required a form of punishment if it could be proven. The accusation of a male witch was not wholly related to the question that the man in question was bookish, but it was a component. Overall, the male witch needed to be sufficiently antisocial to meet the expectations of um, antisocial to the expectations of surrounding English community. These behaviors for men were often community infighting between neighbor or a series of neighbors, even brought up in the court system, be it local, county, or central. More often than not, it was other men who would accuse the, the male witches. And so their issues would be tied to the male sphere of traditional patriarchy. If magic can be a tool for helping and hurting, but it, the accusations of magic is the other side of the coin. A magic user is both a benefit and a danger to their community, and it is up to that community to say which. In Normandy, a witch was not the archetype of a woman, but could be a shepherd. A man out of bounds from the local society exposed to wilderness, but they also had access to occult items such as food venom and other types of animal magic. On the other hand, witches could also be priests, Christians, pharmacists, or any other type of literal men, literate men. In these cases, books and other forms of written magic feature in the accusations. In England, the male witch was the bookish type who needed to blend in with male expect with English expectations of what patriarchal manhood meant among their non-witch peers. Failing that meant the accusations being brought up constantly until the matter was finally resolved, be it in exile or death. From both Normandy and England, we can see that it is the suspicion of intent and not necessarily the evidence of texts that have led to the male witch accusations and ensuing deaths. The suspected intent was scrutinized by the local community, and if the men in question were found wanting in terms of expectations, they would be brought to trial. While women were seen as inherently tempted to do witchcraft, it was the male witch who failed to retain the lack of, in of inherent temptation. He had the choice to choose and chose wrong, given more agency than the female witch, but punished harshly for it nonetheless. Thanks, Amaya. Very, very well done. I'm proud, I'm proud of you. So I will, uh, I will continue uh, now with uh, with my part of the presentation. And again, thank you very much to to Maya, for whom I think this is the first international presentation. So uh, you you've done very, very, very well. It's it's really nice to hear that. Okay, um, so again, uh, good evening, and I will also start uh, sharing my screen. Just a second. Okay, and there we are. Okay. Uh, so again, this uh, the topic of uh, my part uh, of the paper is again the reading and writing of magic or the gendered use of magic books. And uh, this paper started from uh, my interest in the possibility of employing ethnographic or anthropological comparisons for the study of ancient magic. It is well known that the further back we go in time, the smaller the amount of data that illuminates the circumstances surrounding magical practices. We benefit from the survival of magic texts and objects, and sometimes from the existence of non-magical sources, not emic but ethic ones, that shed light on magical practices, 
but the information remains terse in comparison to that from later periods. One topic that I found particularly interesting was that of the gender of magic users and producers. Scholarship of ancient and late antique magic tends to refer to this topic quite rarely. And this is one of the reasons that I thought we should do this presentation in a comparative fashion. Uh, and in fact, it ties in very well with what uh, Marco was saying before in his paper about the fact that there are limits to comparisons, comparisons and its limits. Nevertheless, some comparisons can be proved to be useful. So what I will be doing today in my presentation is first of all, continue with this introduction about the gender related aspects in the produ production and use of magic manuals. And then I would like us to look together at some of the early evidence and the questions it should raise, but unfortunately it rarely does. And then move on to look at one particular piece of uh, medieval and early modern evidence. And lastly, I would uh, sum up by offering some reflection on conclusions and some desiderata. So, as I, as I mentioned before, uh, the topic of the gender of magic users and producers is rarely discussed in scholarship. In fact, scholarship of ancient and late ancient magic tends to refer almost invariably to the producers of magic texts as male. We are all familiar with descriptions stating that the magician copied the amulet from the recipe manual and then he rolled it up. It is always the he that rolls it up. To give a more concrete example, I would like to quote uh, two sentences from Matthew Dickey, who is a great scholar and he is one of the few people who actually worked on the topic of gender and written magic. So, uh, in uh, Matthew Dickey's book uh, on magic and magicians in the Greek or Roman world, he says, in the Hellenistic period, new kinds of magic workers made their appearance and educated and literate men began to make collections of magical lore. These collections of magical lore are in fact the manuals that we refer to here. So the practitioner is usually assumed to be a he when the practice is one involving writing. Only rarely attempts were made to substantiate this assumption or even further discuss it. Among these attempts, we find the work of Fritz Graf, Matthew Dickey that we have mentioned already, David Frankfurter, Kimberly Stratton, who were also uh, preceded or paralleled, though in different forms, by John Winkler and Christopher Pharaoh. Now, in the second quote from Dickey that you see here, when he discusses the practice of love magic in Roman Egypt, he suggested that, for all we know, women may have had a preference for forms of erotic spells that leave no trace in the material record. Or they may have lacked the confidence to approach the male scribes or magicians who supplied the ficciones. Or they may have lacked the financial means to pay for the services of these scribes. Magicians. The assumption thus is that the practitioners who inscribed binding spells on lead tablets or papyri were male. When he referred to the authors of the formularies, however, in a different place in that article, Dickey did not engage in a discussion of their gender, thus following the same assumption quoted before. In the case of ancient, late antique and medieval Jewish magic, we encounter a similar situation that most of you are probably familiar with from your reading of scholarly literature from the past decades. The topic of the gender of producers and users of, mag of written magic is rarely discussed. When the topic is mentioned, for example, in the work of Gideon Bohak, who is here in the audience, also then it is only briefly. So, for instance, Bohak says, by referring to our scribe as a he, I do not wish to exclude the possibility that the amulets, in fact, were produced by a female practitioner. But given the gendered aspects of medieval Jewish literacy, a male producer seems more likely. So here too, even though there is some mention of magical practices, we have almost no mention of magic manuals or formularies 
Noroflu's recipes, such as we know, circulated throughout late antiquity and the Middle Ages. Consequently, the positioning of gender in the scenarios of written magical practices remains obscure. I am currently working on a larger project meant to illuminate some parts of this picture. In a paper recently presented at a Yale Judaic Studies conference on Aramaic incantation bowls, I discussed the gender of the producers and users of these objects, the bowls, in their late antique Mesopotamian context. I have shown that current scholarship takes for granted several gender-related issues and that it would be beneficial to the study of magic bowls should these issues be addressed systematically. As seen above, also the prevailing attitude in other areas of magic research is similar, taking for granted or not even addressing gender issues related to the composition, copying and use of magic manuals and recipes. When these are addressed, mostly one gender features in the story the male one. The purpose of my paper thus is to question this historiographic preconception, not to prove it wrong, mind you, just to question it, and to see what benefits could be found if we apply a comparative approach to the study of gender and magic books. Let us look first at the ancient evidence concerning the gender of magic manuals, users and producers. In his book on the grimoires, Owen Davis states that evidence of women owing or using grimoires, so books of magic, is scant before the 16th century. Some examples that do exist do not clearly indicate that women were actively producing or copying magic manuals, nor that they were reading them. Also in literary sources from the Greek or Roman world, there are almost no suggestions that women were employing magic manuals. Also in literary, non-magical sources, figures such as Erichto, Simaitha, and Pamphile practice magic, but do so without recipes. A possible exception is Horace's poetic descriptions of poetic description of Canidia, where in one verse, the poet refers to the books, quote, books of incantations, whose effect can unfix the stars and call them down from the sky. But this is part of an adjuration uttered by the male speaker and not necessarily suggest that Canidia herself was seen as using such books. Now, Jewish sources referring to male practitioners of magic, labeled witches or mechashefa, do not describe them either as employing books nor as performing magical practices that involve writing, which is one of the topics I described in my previous paper on Mesopotamian bones. On the other hand, we also do not hear of men employing such manuals, despite the fact that they are known to have existed. A fragment of such a manual was discovered in Qumran and dated to the first century BCE. It was edited several times and probably the most precise rendering was that of uh, Joseph Nové, uh, who also uh, mentioned it in a broader magical context without discussing gender, of course. And this particular fragment mentions harmful male and, super, and female supernatural entities. In this, it resembles in part the incantation books, as well as a rather strange phrase about women in confinement who bear children of rebelliousness and evil irreverence. Now, this fragment is written in what is described by Nave as a semi-formal hand, meaning that it was not necessarily the work of an expert scribe. No, uh, nowhere, however, are there discussions about the production and use of such early magic books in Judaism. Now, regardless of the question who put them down on parchment, one could also ask who composed or invented such incantations, which is, of course, not the same thing. But these questions are rarely, not to say never, raised. And I believe that they should be. Moving forward in time to late antiquity, more evidence is available. Manuals of magic, such as the famous Greek magical papyri or the Jewish book of mysteries, Sefer Razin, have survived either in the original or in much later medieval copies. Yet they all preserve a rather clear picture of magical practices from the early part of the first millennium CE. 
these manuals are taken to be compositions of male experts and this destined for the use of male practitioners. Even though some of the recipes they include could very well have been of use to women. Furthermore, some of the recipes do not include instructions for inscribing a text for which the practitioner would have needed to be literate or able to write, but only instructions to manipulate some magical materials or to utter a brief incantation that could be remembered by heart without needing to write it down. Thus, if a Jewish woman in fourth century Alexandria had a male friend who wanted to read to her from Sefer HaRazim, she could actually learn magical practices that she could use later without needing to write a single word. Not only that, but we can actually get rid of the male friend and raise the option that the Jewish woman herself could be able to read the Book of Mysteries in the original, as we know that some Jewish women during late antiquity were literate, and even more than that, they were learned, they were schooled. Such evidence, in my opinion, should raise the set of questions that you see here on this particular slide. These are questions that have rarely been addressed for late antiquity, and I believe it is high time that they should be. This is where the benefits of comparisons come to the fore. I would like us to travel further in time to 14th century Italy, to the city of Perugia. Here in 1347, the court of the medieval inquisition prosecuted a woman from Pisa by the name of Ricola di Puccio. The charges brought against her were sorcery and she was identified as a venefica et incantatrix et invocatrix malorum immundurum spiritum. So she is invoking these uh, evil and dirty spirits. Uh, and this is why she stands trial. Now, among the practices that are recorded in Ricola de Puccio's uh, accusations is one related to love magic. And this is how I actually got to this particular uh, passage, which I also quoted in my book about love magic. She was accused that she tried to separate a married couple using demonic adjurations in order to make them hate one another. The accused took an egg laid by a black chicken. She cooked it and she split it into two throwing half of it to a dog and the other half to a cat. While doing this, Ricola was said to have explain, exclaimed, may the love of these two be divided as this egg is separated and may there be love between them as there is between this dog and this cat. Other two people from Italy used the same method in order to separate a pair of lovers. They, they uh, are attested in the city of Modena, some 170 years later, after Ricola de Puccio stood trial. And by the way, her trial ended with a death sentence as she was burnt at the stake. In 1517, a Catholic priest by the name of Guglielmo Campana, who was rector of the Church of San Michele in Modena, was brought before the Inquisition following charges of heresy and sorcery. And among other magical actions that are similar to the ones mentioned by Maya in her paper, he was also accused of teaching other people a recipe to provoke hate between different persons, taking an egg and using many superstitions and feeding it to a cat and a dog. The word superstition here, of course, as you can understand from the context, refers to magical formulae. Now, since we are already familiar with this ritual of separation from the previous trial of Nicola di Puccio, we can understand what the recipe he was teaching these people was. Two years later, again in the judicial protocols of Modena, we encountered the description of a magical procedure that is very similar to the previous two. In this time, it is said, this time it is said to have been used by a woman, Anastasia da Cotigliano nicknamed La Frapona, who also wished to separate her own lover from another mistress he had, Polisena. And the trial protocol states that she also took an egg, cooked it in water from three, three fountains, and then split it with a thread and wrote the name of Giulio on one piece, the name of Polisena on the other. And of course, you can already guess the rest. 
she fed one part to a cat and another part to the dog. Now, what do these trial protocols from Italy have to do with the question of magic manuals? In two recipe books from the Cairo Organiza, we encounter the exact same procedure for separating a pair of lovers, once in Hebrew and another time in Judeo-Arabic. These fragments are paleographically dated to the 14th or 15th century, so they correspond to the period when the same magical practice is attested in northern Italy. If we were to rely entirely on the assumption that only men composed and used magic manuals, then the intricate relationship resulting from this story that I have shared with you would be lost. Here, however, is an obvious case where a magical practice circulated between men and women, and at some point, someone wrote it down on paper. Maybe, conversely, it began as a written recipe invented by someone, either a man or a woman, that was later transmitted or read by women such as Ricola de Puccio. So we have here a very complex and intricate relationship in which some recipes appear on paper in magic books, and they're also shown to have been put into practice in several trials from a totally different country and a to even a different continent. In this case, at least two of these cases are by women. So they appear in recipe books on the one hand, they are used by women on the other hand. What is the relationship between these cases? In the last part of the paper, I would like to mention that women could also employ written magic objects, meaning books or loose leaflets with recipes, in other ways than just reading them or reproducing their content. What I refer to is the magical use of books, where the book functions as a powerful magical object due to its content, but the content is not used or referenced in itself. A common example of this practice that still exists today is the carrying of little Bible or, or psalm booklets on one's person. This is a common apotropaic and beneficial practice. And it could have been used also by some women in antiquity. And in fact, we have evidence suggesting that some of the women accused in trials of being in a possession of a magic book were not able to read. So they just held to that magic book, probably for its magical properties, but not to its content. To conclude, this paper was meant to put forward some questions and rather unexplored topics in the field of written magic. The topic of magic manuals and their use by persons of the male or female gender. I have tried to show that ethnographic or anthropological comparisons can shed light on the gendered use of magic manuals in ancient historical periods. And I believe that also the part of the paper read by Maya has done the same. More work needs to be done on the topic. I suggest that the following research steps should be threefold. First of all, raising the awareness of historians of ancient magic to the gender-related questions pertinent specifically to the study of magic manuals and recipes. The initial and almost all-pervasive scholarly assumption is that men composed and copied down these recipes. The subsequent, the subsequent assumption is that they were also the ones who used them in order to perform magical practices especially of the written kind. Women, the scholarly assumption goes, perform practices transmitted orally. These three assumptions need to be placed on the scholarly table and discussed systematically. First, in light of evidence in antiquity. Particularly, we need to ask what the relationship was between women and these objects. It is evident that some women in late antiquity and in the Middle Ages were literate and could both read and write. If they wanted to compose magic manuals, they could. If they wanted to copy already existing manuals, they could. And if they wanted to merely read such manuals, they also could. The question is whether they did. The second and closely related step 
is to examine the collected data from antiquity in light of later ethnographic or anthropological comparisons. What do modern or early modern, but more particularly modern women who practice what we scholars describe as magic do in relation to books? Modern ritual practitioners from the Middle East or from all around the Mediterranean are both male and female. Literacy rates today are different than in the past, with many women being able to write and even more being able to read. How do these women acquire their magic knowledge? And how do they transmit it to others? Do they employ magic manuals in order to learn how to perform healing, apotropaic, or aggressive practices? Or are these rituals taught orally by and for these women? And in both cases, who is the transmitting agent? Are these men, women, or both? Do modern practitioners, especially the illiterate ones, employ books of magic in other ways than reading them, namely as magical objects, just as we have seen the little psalm books and the little Bibles? Lastly, the third steps concerns method. A sound methodology needs to be devised in order to conduct a comparative study, such as the one proposed in this paper. My suggestion would be to employ the expertise of scholars from gender studies alongside cultural anthropologists and historians of magic, that's us, and proceed in an interdisciplinary fashion. The benefits of such a comparative exploration are not limited to the study of ancient magic, and I know that most of us here are ancient magical historians, but they are not limited to that. They, conversely, can lead to a better understanding of modern practices. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, thank you very much, uh, Maya and Ortal Paz. That was great. And of course, thanks to Marco for the first presentation. Uh, I will leave the uh, floor open for questions or comments. Any, anybody would like to ask a question or raise an issue? Yep, yeah, Rana. Um, thanks for these great presentations. Um, this is, I, I guess, a question for Ortal and Maya. Uh, um, uh, I'm wondering whether um, it's possible to think about studying gender primarily in sort of intersection with um, ethnicity and class, um, whether that might provide kind of a further focusing of the comparative cases. Uh, it seems to me that um, since conditions, you know, uh, sociology of knowledge and um, literacy and all sorts of things vary so considerably over these, you know, different contexts, whether um, having an eye towards where gender intersects with some, you know, other comparative features um, of actors in, in our situations might, and whether that kind of brings up anything for you in terms of the material you, you've been looking at. I'll go ahead first. Yeah. Um, so, funny that you bring that up. Uh, some of my sources actually talk about uh, sociology in particular when it comes to the social constructs of the male witches, burned the European witch trials in comparison to the women who were accused. It was a little bit more of a men who were of high standing that couldn't blend into what they were expected to do were the accused, whereas women who were of lower standing and could be seen as easier uh, scapegoats were the ones who were punished, but that's in this case. I had other research sources that I um, had to discard because there was just too much to talk about. Um, Dr. Sar <laughs> knows what I mean. Um, and it is definitely a really good idea to look at magic in terms of ethnicity, but also social standing, because if magic is a tool, that means that people are using these tools for different things and we have to study where it's being applying 
how and why and the effects that it has. Um, there are, is a cultural group in Papua New Guinea that um, practices magic, but it's used as a way to get rid of rivals. And it's oral based magic um, with uh, organic material as like um, in jars and you shake it and you hide it away after saying words. However, if you are suspected of using it, like your neighbors have to look for it and for the bottle in like this large group setting where the community turns against you for using magic, even though you're expected to use magic to get ahead in life. It's different situations. It, it's a great means to study magic once you look at the different situations and bring up an amazing point. It's just a lot to look at. <laughs> I entirely agree, and just one one little thing to to add uh, to to what uh, Ranan was uh, was mentioning and, and was asking. I think this is a great idea because if we look at uh, literacy rates, modern literacy rates, and this is this is something I've been doing for this uh, for this paper, we can see that of course uh, modern literacy rates are much higher today than they were two thousand years ago. Uh, however, if we look at the Middle East, there are still differences between what is happening in Egypt, what is happening in Yemen, what is happening in Palestine and, and Israel, which, by the way, are almost identical in terms of literacy rates, so nearly 100 percent uh, for both men and women. And I was wondering how interesting it would be to compare what uh, women magical practitioners do in each of these countries given the fact that literacy rates are different in each of them, do we also see a change in what these women are doing? Because it can also shed light on what was happening in, in antiquity, in different regions in antiquity. There we would have less, perhaps, less evidence about what was happening per country, but more about what was happening per class. So if you had a chance to have more educated magical practitioners, both male and female, what would be the situation in one case and what would be the converse situation in another? So thank you very much for this question. It's uh, very useful. Great, thank you. Uh, Marco, you had a question and then David. Yes, just question and remarks and everything. It's, uh, it was of course very interesting for me, this gendered approach. And uh, unfortunately, um, <clears throat> as, we, as we well know, in late antiquity, it's completely unpredictable, the rate of literacy we had. And uh, even if it's unpredictable, we, we can surely say that it was very, very low. And um, it could be different in some areas, but I'm afraid we cannot be sure even in the lowest percentages. But there is something interesting in uh, this uh, great spread of uh, non-literacy, but when we study uh, documents that imply a literacy. Of course, also in literacy, there are some degrees. So we can go on and on and on and make uh, something like a, a Talmudic discussion, but without any conclusion, I'm afraid, uh, in this case. Um, in any case, what, what I, I would say, I would suggest is that it's very difficult, but it's fascinating. Uh, uh, I think you know the uh, recent literature about the so-called visual literacy. Visual literacy, which is this kind of uh, very fascinating, but it's historically well demonstrated fact that even if you are a un completely unliterate, unliterate man or women or woman or whatever, or a kid also, you can recognize the script you are uh, faced with, and you can more or less say at least, we are at home, we are far from home, or something like that. And in this case, I would, I would say that perhaps there is a, uh, an interesting section of our studies that could be investigated in this sense. It is very difficult, I think, but it could be when this visual literacy, literacy applies to uh, what we say pseudoscripts and drawings. And of course, uh, there is, in my opinion, in this visual literacy, uh, the possibility of having a, a series of drawings or scripts that can, can be attributed to a, a female scribe. 
for for some reasons I cannot say, but why not? I mean, if if we can, if we can add, if we can uh, reconstruct for some symbols uh, the old develop development that's maybe easier in medieval and modern times. This could be one of the the ways of uh, throwing light to this uh, female literacy in uh, in incantation text, which I believe there was a share of scribes uh, of female scribes and that it's all that's all, that's not only because of the comparison in this case as uh, gives us data but it because it's logic frankly speaking i mean we cannot pretend that all women were kept under a sort of uh, uh, unliteracy and uh, they could not scribe they could not write anything they could not even think of reading something. Simply, the transmission of information about this is completely erased. So, so it's it's all in in all other fields. I'm afraid. So you can. I'm just and so, sorry, please. So just just say I just, just wanted to say that that also the visual literacy is, in my opinion, uh, a field that we we we, we can consider. It's, it's very difficult, but it is in any case. Uh, could be one of the, the tools we have to record this, the other side of the literacy. We don't have the, the female literacy in magic. I was just wondering, Marco, because that's a fascinating point that you made about the visual literacy, and that's that's definitely uh, correct. By the way, this, this is why I kept referring to they could read and write, because we know that these are not the same thing, and some people can actually read, but they cannot write. Uh, they can reproduce. Uh, some some sort of drawing of writing, but they cannot write actually. So I was wondering how you you because of this really interesting comment. How would you go about first recognizing a set of uh, symbols of or writing that pertain in particular to women uh, in in your field? So in the bowls, for instance, do you have any suggestions how to start? I I frankly. Uh, I, I, I got, uh, I, I, I became aware of, of drawings uh, uh, as, uh, as they asked me to, became, uh, to become aware of them. I mean, I, uh, I was discussing once with Shaul Shaked and they told me, uh, have, you ever see, have you ever considered these drawings? No, no, I just considered the participles. So I said, so I, I so, you know, uh, I come from, I mean, as, as a, my education comes from a very uh, classical philology uh, curriculum. I met, by chance, I met Semitic uh, studies be, uh, through Egyptology. And so I met Penacchietti, and that was my Damascus uh, revelation. Uh, you know, I became, it became like a, a, a flashing uh, light that illuminated the fact that I could study Aramaic and and I mean being engaged in this in these matters. So basically, I, I started with language, and I'm still, you know, very much attached to that to, to this to these kind of problems. But while reading all this stuff about literacy that I wanted to read, because it came, it came out, it comes out that something you can, for example, as you said, you can read, but you cannot write. And so you can copy something likely. So I think that uh, Waller is the man to be asked about this. I don't know if the, the pronunciation is Waller because he's, uh, he, 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 is, he works in, in the Netherlands or, or Waller, as we would say in, in the, in the Anglo-Saxon uh, pronunciation. Phonetic, phonetics is very fascinating, you can stay hours to say waller, 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 and the, the vowel begin, becomes big and, and, and low and so. But he, is, he wrote this very interesting paper in 2020 on Journal of Near Eastern Studies. And there about the so-called pseudoscript. And, and he is a very, he knows very well, very well the magical literature. I would say the, the, the literature about magic, far more better than me. And, and he is very, uh, uh, there is a lot of bibliography in the notes. And that's where, that's where I started my exploration of visual 
literacy. I just just want to add that in this in these very months, uh, there is quite a, 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 a series of studies that are being prepared that I, I, I am seeing drafts about them that are dealing with visual literacy in connection with the uh, invention of the alphabet. So it's it's very it's it's a, a, a something that is coming is popping up in in a, in a very uh, in, in very important I mean uh, uh, and old issues such as the invention of the alphabet. So I cannot say much more. I, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, thank you for raising this issue. Uh, a funny anecdote: when I was. Um, working on this British library spell that goes across to um, sheets. Uh, the British library, I think it's Oriental Manuscript 67964, 6796. <clears throat> there's, a, there's a space in which it goes from the, the regular script, uh, the Coptic script of the practitioner to this ring script. And uh, when I was working on it, um, my son who was two years old came up to me and he saw me and and I was, and I just out of an experiment just said, you know, can you tell the difference? Where, where does it, where does it change? And he knew exactly where it changed from the regular script to the ring script. So even somebody who doesn't know how to read English, let alone Coptic could kind of recognize differences in script simply by just looking at these things. So just a anecdote there, totally unscientific. But anyway, David, did you want to say something? Yeah, just to underline, I think two points that Marco was was moving towards. One is that I'm a little bit doubtful about a methodology that simply asks um, whether women were writing or reading manuals. That that this is that that question is, as Marco said, ultimately uh, dependent on women's literacy in general. Women aren't going to be reading and writing manuals more or less than other kinds of contracts and other kinds of literature. Um, but the other thing is, and this is where, uh, Artel Paz, I thought your your point about um, the miniature Bibles and um, iconic texts is actually really important. I, th I think in some ways the most important uh, area is what interactions with literate materials are possible for non-literate people. And this is where Marco's point about um, not just uh, not just pictures and drawings, but um, pseudoscripts, uh, um, co copying of strange things, uh, using uh, using Bibles or or texts for divination purposes. Um, there are multiple ways in which people who are non-literate can interact with with textual materials. I think that, in some ways, allows uh, women's uh, magical culture, if you will, to have a little bit more integrity on its own, rather than being dependent on on uh, manuals. Um, which I think in some ways is just one aspect of the world of magic. So that's a bit of a challenge to you, Ortel Paz. Yeah, thank you very much, David, for this for this comment. I would just like to stress that I do not envisage a methodology in which we would be able to actually provide uh, historical answers to these questions because there is no way to do that. However, I do believe that it is important that we raise these questions. And in fact, for the most part, when people discuss magic manuals, it is just as I have shown in the quotations at the beginning, uh, it is rarely done with the idea in mind that there was some sort of interaction of more than one gender with these manuals. So in addition to the fact that women could actually own them uh, or touch them or interact with them as uh, powerful objects, uh, to use a, a modern term uh, in, in themselves, there could also be a different form of exchange of information in which a woman invents a particular practice, such as let us cut an egg in two and throw it to half of it to a dog and half of it to a, uh, to a cat. And then this practice is transmitted from the woman 
to another person, and it can be a man, it can be another woman, who puts this down in writing. So also this aspect of who is actually composing those practices that we see in the manuals, this is also not something that has been investigated for the most part. Again, this is a generalization, and there are cases when people actually mention a little bit about it. Uh, but it, in the most part, this question of who was responsible for composing these practices? Was it always the men who wrote them down? Or could it be actually that there was a woman who invented the practice and she discussed it with a man and the man put it down in a, uh, in a magic manual such as those two that we have in the Cairo Geniza. So I don't know where it started, whether it started in Italy or somewhere else in the Mediterranean and it was a female practice, so to say. And then it was transmitted little by little and eventually written down by two different men and ended up in the Cairo Geniza. Maybe it was the other way around, as I suggested also in the paper. We don't know, but I believe it is extremely important to ask these questions because they shed light. And, and I think you uh, you have also mentioned that in relation to the little booklets. They shed light on, on the more general culture of object and text and society in, in general. Great, thanks. <clears throat> and also in the use of, of little books, I think uh, most of us are aware of this testimony of Chrysostom as well as uh, Jerome in the women supposedly in uh, using these uh, little gospel texts um, as amulets. Um, yeah, no, I think it's, it's a point well taken. Other questions or comments? I, I was going to say- No, uh, please. About, yeah. Bouncing off what was about, and um, David had said about uh, the use of uh, the act of writing things on who invented these things. While it's further in the future, um, I highly propose, I'm anthropology, I strong belief that a lot of the things that humans do are things that we've done in the past as well, or you know, kind of not necessarily uh, routine, but some things work more so than others. In a case in Slovenia from the 18th century, and also a case in, oh, in Slovenia, and I believe also Russia, one of um, my other sources I'm going to put in, uh, but they have cases of men who are found with these grimoires. Uh, in Slovenia, they were called books of Golomon, uh, which when I looked them up, didn't have an outright explanation, but I believe they're a form of the Book of Solomon, is the men were found having these books within their family. All of the women associated with that man would be assumed to be a witch, be it a sister, a mother, a daughter, however long. And if a witch was found within the community, the suspicion on her would also fall in line with the rhetoric of whether or not a man in her family had the book. And it, this, it just came up and went, and it was a suspicion of these texts could be in line with family tradition. Oh, the other, uh, when I was, it wasn't Russia, it was actually also in England, the Lincoln Thornton uh, manuscript, which also in the future, I believe, was the 15th, uh, no, 17th century uh, recipe book of folk tale. Uh, cure-alls, but written as form of either food or like toothache. So they'd be very minor kitchenware magic that ended up becoming a family tradition and would still be magic and be scrutinized. Meanwhile, Robert Thornton, who was the owner of the manuscript, was a devout Christian. And in some of his texts, he then talks about um, magic that was given to, um, oh, the Three Brothers uh, script. Three brothers were blessed by Jesus and given like magic only for doing it for good and without pay. And he had that script in his manuscript. And it's a random thing of first century <laughs> spell in a 15th century manuscript. And just like, okay, well, how did this man come across it? it? Had to be from within the family. So if we're talking about how people are divining and also writing down these scripts, I believe looking through family trees and relationships within their community. A lot of communities back then were just big families. Looking back to see where people are coming from and who they're intermarrying in, and if later on down the line, magic pops up, that could be a great way to see why these books are coming and going over time. You know, 15th century to 16th century witch trials, all of the books are supposedly destroyed. They kept on popping back, and if they popped back up in 18th century Slovenia out of 
nowhere. Some something's up. So I think we should look towards I would call it kitchen magic, but it's really just familial community magic and grow from there. It would also be a great way to see how people today are using magic because it's, I mean, I come from the States and a lot of the like, neo-paganism and the reclaiming of indigenous cultural beliefs stems from what is essentially kitchen magic. Thanks for raising that. Uh, Marco, you wanted to respond. N not exactly respond, but okay. I just re I just I just recall the fact that David in a, in a, the article about the origin of the incantation bowl wrote uh, that uh, from the point of view of materiality the bowls are kitchenware, and so somewhere there should be I should be I, should, I, I, I thank you for the <laughs> for the suggestion because I, I you know it comes now to my mind that that was uh, kitchenware actually and so I, I i cannot i i used to cook at home but i cannot imagine all the <laughs> all the all the kitchens in in sasanian babylonian crowded with chefs with you know these these big hats with white hats cooking and then inscribing the bowl just you know so it's very interesting so it's you know materiality is another of that uh, subject that nowadays is going to Yes, I, I, I was asked a, a contribution about the materiality of incantation bowls, and I must admit that I am uh, working uh, uh, very, very much upon the, the, the work of David. So David, thank you that you will be quoted a lot of times because they asked me this in 30 days. So, you know, it's, but it's, it seems that materiality also with magic is, is so very, very nice, this, this reference. So it's kitchenware. So. We should go back to the kitchenware. Thank you. Or Tom? <clears throat> I think you need to turn on your mic. I'm giving you because it's raining cats and dogs here, so it's uh, it's very loud. I no, apologies for that. I actually had a question for Marco, and it is a bit related to what you mentioned now about the kitchen, and uh, but it's it's something that I thought about during your presentation about the the comparison. Have you ever tried uh, looking into a comparison between uh, your bowls or the bowls in general and those uh, metal? Uh, Islamic bowls that we have inscribed inside, not with ink, but inside, actually incised metal. Uh, that, uh, so for, as far as I know, most people have not done such a comparison uh, because linguistically, if we work on Aramaic, then we don't work on Arabic and, and vice versa. Uh, but uh, in, in your case, I believe perhaps with your, your knowledge and your expertise, you you could do something like that. So I was wondering if you ever thought about it, if you ever looked at those bowls. Um, actually, I, I have a couple of dead bowls uh, at home um, because I you can bo you can buy it in I, I bought in it, it I bought them in Baghdad many many years ago, and you can buy them. It's easy and they're quite cheap. But I I never I never compared. I must admit. I, I know that, for example, in, in one of these bowls I have, uh, they have uh, they it's it's they are very very nicely uh, incised, and there are the last three surah of the Quran, and uh, and the seller told me that uh, if I have, for example, headache, I can put water inside and then drink it, and, and the headache goes on goes away. But I never compared. I I, I never tried such a. I, 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 until now, it's uh, as I wanted to, you know, to keep the linguistic uh, corpus homogeneous. I did not, uh, if not very rarely, uh, consider uh, texts outside the uh, geographical and more or less uh, chronological uh, framework I decided to work on. That's that's a common, of course, methodological approach in uh, linguistic uh, uh, diversity investigations. Uh, that's it's quite clear that you cannot investigate the language of Shakespeare compared with the nowadays Cockney dialect in London. 
or I would say better in London in, in the Cockney. In any case, uh, that's, that's quite uh, limiting from the point of view of comparatism, uh, of course, uh, in, the, in the other sense, uh, but it's for linguistic studies is fundamental. So I never did this kind of uh, this, this kind of comparison. Sometimes I quoted amulets, but Syriac amulets that are very few and that are uh, difficult to read. I think that Niels could uh, explain us how it's difficult to to read. Or today, nowadays, the, the text read by Ginu are almost disappeared uh, on the on the manuscript. So, but I did not do this comparison. Gideon, you wanted to say something. Just a short answer to Ortal's uh, question. Yuval Harari wrote two papers in which he surveyed, unfortunately they are in Hebrew, but he wrote two papers in which he surveyed the whole phenomenon of bowls moving up to modern Islamic bowls. So there he has, and he has nice images, and you can show that, and he doesn't argue for continuity, but he says, look, we have here, at least the artifacts sometimes look a little bit similar. So, so he covers all this ground. Yeah, so these articles, thank you, Gide, these articles I know. Uh, however, most so most of the people who have done this type of work have not really looked into the uh, Arabic, the early Islamic metal bowls that yeah. are in fact chronologically adjacent to what we have from the Aramaic uh, bowls because they start early. And the early samples, the early specimens, they're found in, in museum, uh, including in the British Museum, I believe. And no one is doing this sort of uh, comparative, comparative work. Uh, and I believe it could be interesting. And this is why I had this question for Marco, because some of these early specimens of the Arabic magic bowls, they contain uh, vocus magicae. And I have a feeling that some of these vocus magicae could actually be Aramaic texts that if we only had uh, enough uh, patience uh, to look into this Arabic uh, Arabic text, we would discover actually uh, some of this, uh, some of our original. So I, could, I can show you one that is that I think I identified as Aramaic, uh, but my Arabic is insufficient to actually conduct a full-scale project on that. But this is why I asked uh, Anko. This should be relatively easy to verify. So, you know, if you want to send me the Arabic text, I can tell you, at least, you know, I, I can I can see and, and see whether it makes sense in Aramaic or not. Because, they're, they're, of course, Arabic magical texts have numerous vocus magicae taken from all over the place. So, yeah, it would be interesting. As far as I can see, there is a, a bowl uh, I talked about with uh, James that is written in uh, Kufic, but it is, the language is Syria. So. Yeah, and of course, there, there are several Arabic language bowls, very few, but of, the, of what we call, you know, the incantation bowls, yes. the clay bowls, there are a very uh, small number, there's a very small number yeah. of uh, bowls in Arabic, clearly going up to the eighth century. So this is something we can document from the, from the Arabic bowls. Uh, about the metal bowls, you know, which have the, the text engraved on them and not uh, written in ink. This is a different story. I don't know. I, I always thought that they start much later, but I, I'll be glad to learn otherwise. So. <clears throat> Any other comments or questions that anybody wants to raise? Well, thank you everyone for this uh, very successful first session. We'll be having more uh, as part of the project um, coming up, especially in the fall. And uh, please join me in uh, visually uh, thanking our speakers for uh, really uh, two slash three wonderful papers. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joe, and thank you everybody. Thank, Thank you, so you very much. It was very nice. Very interesting. <laughs> Thank you for. Uh... Oh, wow. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I enjoyed it. Oh, Abigail is. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Got the I whole gang there. Yeah. Um, they were very interested to know what is Ranan's cat's name. Um, oh, wow. There's a lot of people there. Uh, this is Neko, um, which means apparently, you know, the cats that do this, you know, Manaki Neko. <laughs> nice. <laughs> bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, Thank bye, you. Bye. 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 bye.